You are listening to the Yonder Mountain String Band, a band I just interviewed a few days ago at Seattle Showbox Theater. This is Jason Verlinde, the publisher of the Fredboard Journal, and you are listening to our 36th podcast. Uh, I just wanted to give you a few updates uh, in case you haven't tuned in to fretboardjournal.com uh, lately. We just relaunched our homepage, uh, and it looks fantastic. We're sharing a ton of great content from both our print editions and also some exclusive online content. Great photo essays. We've got an incredible album stream from a guitarist named Ben Hall, a young guy who sounds so much like Merle Travis and Chet Atkins. Uh, great stuff. You can listen to the whole album on our site right now. A uh, ton of great stuff. A blog post about the recent Four Seasons concert that just took place in New York City featuring the guitars of John Monteleone. We have a great photo essay featuring uh, the CF Martin factory in Nazareth, Pennsylvania. And a lot more. So feel free to go over to fretboardjournal.com, poke around. We also have classifieds now for our readers. If you ever wanted to unload or buy a uh, piece of gear, go there. You can post it for free. You can post images. Uh, it's a nice experience. And uh, what else is going on? We just got a stack of advanced copies of the Fretboard Journal's 21st issue from our printer. It finally finished printing. It's going to be mailing out to subscribers in just about a week. In it, uh, Marty Stewart, Paul Languedoc, uh, The National, uh, a builder close to my heart, Eric Solomon, Solomon Guitars. He builds these really beautiful, uh, modern-looking uh Archtops, great little photo essay of his shop. A uh, whole bunch in that issue. We kind of tinkered with the design of the home of the uh, the cover as well. So uh, we hope you'll check that out. You can pick that up by subscribing to Fretboard Journal. Uh, easy enough. Go to fretboardjournal.com. Uh, it'll also be at, of course, Borders and Barnes and Nobles and uh, finer guitar stores everywhere uh, in just a few weeks. So uh, really excited about that. Our first issue of 2011. Uh, today's podcast, I interviewed Joe Spann, who is a great historian for uh, musical instrument knowledge, uh, just a couple days ago. He's got a new book coming out, uh, on Center St published by Center Stream Press, on vintage Gibsons, which, as anybody who's ever collected vintage Gibsons may know, uh, there's a lot of mysteries behind those guitars. There's a lot of one-off guitars. There's uh, the factory order number instead of serial numbers, so it makes it really confusing if you've got a an old L00 and you want to try to figure out what exact year it came from. Uh, so Joe's book sounds really intriguing to me and I had a great interview with him and here it is. Thanks so much. Well, thanks for talking to the uh, Fretboard Journal. I wanted to just ask you about Span's Guide to Gibson, which is coming out, uh, when is it, May 1st? I think uh, I think we got May eleventh. May eleventh, the last okay. thing I heard. And uh, you know, it's uh, as as many Gibson collectors know. Uh, you know, there's always been these weird holes in Gibson's history and the factory ordered numbers and one-off guitars. And I just kind of wanted to hear why you decided to to write this book and and how long you've been working on it. Okay, I'll give you a little background uh, about myself. Uh, I was uh, a professional musician for 10 years, uh, five years on the road as a lead guitar player, and five years in uh, local Florida theme parks, Disney, SeaWorld, uh, Bush Gardens, that kind of thing, uh, you know, playing shows out there every day. Uh, and then uh, about 20 years ago, I sort of uh, went to a part-time status as a musician, continued to play, but... Uh, took a job as a director of a research library here in the state of Florida. Um, and I'm a, a certified genealogist. So uh, research is really what I do mm -hmm. uh, you know, every day, day in and day out. Uh, and about, uh, about four years ago, uh, it occurred to me that uh, I could use those genealogical skills to uh, sort of shed a little light on uh, the Gibson story. Um, I, uh, I, of course, played uh, Gibson instruments for years, uh, banjo, flat-top guitars and things, uh, very, very much into that uh, pre-war mystique. And uh, 
so, uh, you know, I just sort of had a revelation one day that I could use these genealogical skills to perhaps find some of the people who worked at Gibson before World War II. Uh, <laughs> and much to my delight, uh, it worked out very well. Uh, I was able to find a couple of those fellows still alive, uh, of course, in their 90s now. How far back did uh, they go? When were they working at Gibson? Uh... The one uh, all the way back into the 30s, wow. and, uh, well, in fact, both of them in the 30s. Wow. Um, so, so that, uh, you know, that was a real pleasure to, to, to talk to eyewitnesses, people who saw the daily production and could, uh, could just answer questions about, you know, what, what was inside that, that building there on Parsons Street. You know, what was on the first floor? What was on the second floor? You know, how, what was the flow of production like? Uh, and uh, and it, 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 it sort of expanded from there. I uh, found some children of employees who were uh, now deceased, uh, you know, who, who would go down there and spend time with their dads at the factory uh, and, uh, of course, had wonderful memories of what was going on there. Um, so those, those genealogical skills came in useful to get that firsthand information. Uh, and then I was able to sort of uh, use that uh, to bargain up uh, and uh, make my uh, introduction to some of the uh, more well-known collectors of Gibson memorabilia here in the states, mm -hmm. and uh, you know people who held original documents from the factory, things that had not really been brought to light, uh, and uh, so I was able to uh, get some access to those things, and again bringing the research skills to bear. Uh, I was able to find out about the vendors that Gibson dealt with, people that they bought subassemblies and parts from, uh, where their uh, the lumber came from, uh, the lacquer that they used, uh, just everything, right down to the sandpaper. Jason, uh, I know where the sandpaper came from. <laughs> uh, you know, just just crazy stuff, just crazy stuff, and. Uh, uh, so you know, it just it it's, it took about four years to uh, to pull this together. And did it start uh, out? Did I you know you were going to do a book, or did it just sort of start no. out as research? Yeah, right. It was just kind of a curiosity, uh, you know, sort of a, a a personal challenge. You know, here here I have these genealogical research skills, and uh, you know, wouldn't it be cool to talk to somebody that was actually there? And uh, after I found the first one. And I, you know, I took, of course, very careful notes because I'm crazy that way. And uh, it was like, well, I wonder if I could find another one. Uh, so it wasn't a book to start with. No, it definitely was not. Um, and the, it really became a book. Uh, when I talked to Greg Rich about it. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you know Greg. Sure. Most everybody does. And uh, Greg said, you know, you really, you really should uh, talk to uh, Ron Middlebrook over at Center Stream. And, uh, and and think about doing a book. So as I as I pulled more and more of this information together and talked to various scholars really around the world, people who had collected things, uh, you know, it just really kind of became possible, I guess, at some point. Um, so, and uh, and uh, there you. Go. you uh... You mentioned some former employees. You mentioned some historians. I know Gibson, the corporation as it exists now. You know, it's changed owners. It's not really super tied in with what was going on in the 30s. Were they able to help much, or were you kind of educating them? <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Uh, not at all. Uh, there's, uh, I've had no, uh, no, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, communication with oh, wow. the company as it stands. Uh, they, of course, they, it's not the same company. Sure. Uh, that's all changed. Uh, but uh, no, no, not at all. And, of course, the subject of the book is not the, not the modern company. So it really it doesn't uh, doesn't touch on the modern company whatsoever. Sure. So um, were there any things as a collector and a player that uh, just remain mysteries after all this research you've done for how many years? Well, of course, it, it's a lifetime of, <laughs> of learning about the instruments. Um, anything that still remains a mystery. Um yeah, kind of, you know, how they ever got anything done at Gibson. <laughs> uh, because because it, uh, 
couple things. Uh, you know, management was always a problem. Anyone who's read Walter Carter's work knows that. Uh, you know, Judge Adams, who was president for years and years, uh, sort of looked at Gibson as a cash cow. Uh, you know, he wasn't really concerned about the company. He just wanted the profits. And uh, and so you had this succession of general managers uh and and the the turnover in the factory itself amongst the workforce was was pretty considerable jason mm-hmm. uh, you know there was a there was a core there was a core of people who started you know back in the teens and and worked all the way through the second world war but by and large the uh it, it was more the the rule that uh, people would come there and work for a brief period and then move on to other jobs uh, and, of course, jobs were plentiful in Kalamazoo, even during the depths of the Depression. Uh, it was an industrial town, lots of manufacturing, lots of support industries. Uh, so even even in the depths of the Depression, it wasn't difficult to find another job, you know, if, if you were unhappy. Uh, so it's And it's not at all like the C.F. Martin Company. You know, C.F. Martin, if you want to know... A specific uh, serial number, you know, they've got the books there, and you can look up that specific number and know exactly when it shipped and where it went to. And at Gibson, the culture was very different, very different. Uh, it seemed to be very laissez faire, you know, <laughs> sort of come day, go day. Um, the, uh, it was overwhelmingly Dutch. The workforce, uh, if they weren't born in Holland, then their parents came from Holland. So there was a very cliquish atmosphere there. I, I had that firsthand from actually many people. Uh, you know, if, if you were Dutch, you were in, uh, speci- and also specifically if you had family that was already working there, you know, you were sort of on the inside. Was management but if you Dutch? Were, if you... No, and and that was part of the problem. Okay. Um you know, you look at uh, a lot has been made of the the time that Guy Hart was the uh, the general manager there at Gibson. It was been called the golden period or the golden age, and it truly was. I mean, most of the instruments that we uh, desire now were made during his time as general manager. And and people talk about how hard he was to get along with, and you know, he just didn't have a real rapport with the workforce. Well, there, there's a little more to it than that. Uh, Guy Hart's family was from the South. He was born in Kentucky. His ancestors lived in North Carolina. Uh, you know, he was he was a Southerner. So, can you imagine, Jason? You know, here you are. Uh, you know, you're you're suddenly the general manager of this company, and and you're standing there looking at 150 people, and they're all Dutch. <laughs> you know, and if they don't like you, and you don't like them, you know, you. You, you don't even really speak the language because these people were still uh, still very versed in in uh, the Dutch language you know I'm sure they that's when they wanted to speak among themselves I'm sure that's what they did uh, inside the factory so you know here you've got this guy from from down in Kentucky and he's trying to tell you what to do and you're not real sure about him and he doesn't really understand what you're saying so there was a little culture clash there uh, definitely so you know, it's, it's, and I go into that in the book. It's, it, was, it was a little more uh, complicated situation than it's sometimes made out to be. Uh, another big pivotal figure, of course, in Gibson's history is Lloyd Lore. Was there any new findings on Lore or uh, gossip or anything? Absolutely. <laughs> Good. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and you're right. Uh, Lloyd Lore is central to the, to the pre-war Gibson story. Uh, you know, you can talk about Ted McHugh and some of those other people all you want, but... Uh, uh, you know, Lloyd Moore really sort of picked up the baton where Orville Gibson laid it down. Uh, you know, Orville says we're going to use uh, violin techniques, graduated tops, and those kinds of things to build instruments. But Lore really took it to another level, and, and anybody who's read anything about Gibson knows that. What I was able to bring some light to about Lore, uh, first of all, I found a picture of him that nobody's ever seen before, wow. uh, and, and that's in the book. Uh, but... Uh, if you if you're familiar with Walter Carter's work, mm-hmm. you know that Walter gives us one page on a man named uh, Guy Ferris, who was uh, general manager just before Guy Hart. 
And that he in in Walter's book, he remains somewhat of a mysterious figure. You know, he he came in, he saved the company from financial ruin. Uh, he sort of stepped in his own mess kit with Judge Adams, and Judge Adams fired him. Uh, and he and he disappears from distant history, and he's never heard from again. So uh, that intrigued me as a researcher, and uh, I was actually able to find uh, Guy Ferris's daughter. She's still alive. Wow. Uh, and uh, and find the family and uh, included a lot of information about Mr. Ferris in the book. But here's the really strange thing, Jason. Mr. Ferris was a graduate of Oberlin Institute in Ohio. Sure. Uh, and if you know anything about Lloyd Lohr, you know that Lloyd Lohr was a graduate of Oberlin, <laughs> Oberlin Conservatory. So, here are these two men of the same age. They went to college together. So it's suddenly it's not so strange that that they hire in this this outsider from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to come run the company, uh, and and he gets fired in October of twenty four, I think, and his good friend Lloyd Lohr uh, leaves the company in December of twenty four. So again, there was a there a little more to this story than we've been told that, that met the eye. These two guys knew one another. Uh, you know, Guy Ferris was, uh, he took business in college. He, he really brought a lot of modern business methods to Gibson in the short time that he was there. Uh, he's the one that switched from the teacher agent system over to the dealership system. Uh, it was not Guy Hart that did that. It was Guy Ferris. Uh, and, uh, and he just brought a lot on the management side that is very similar to what Lore brought in the production side of things. Uh, so uh, these two guys, you know, that knew one another, and that's a whole that's a whole episode of in history that was lost. Yeah, um, that was that was really neat, you know, to bring that out. I, I even talked to Roger Simonoff uh, about this, and Roger had no idea, uh, you know, and, and he went back through uh, what materials he has of Lore's uh, correspondence, and he wasn't able to find anything uh, between the two, but. Actually, the correspondence doesn't go back far enough what he has. But, uh, so even he was fascinated to, to find this connection uh, between Lore and Guy Ferris. Yeah, it's amazing. Were you able to, uh, you know, one of the big mysteries for anyone who's got a, an L double O or any, any old vintage Gibson uh, is sort of figuring out what the factory order number stamped on those guitars actually means. Um, everybody's got a different theory. Big sunburst means this, little sunburst means that. Uh, were you able to kind of pinpoint what a factory order number actually means? <laughs> you bet. You bet. In fact, uh, I would say there's more material in the book devoted to factory order numbers than to any other topic. Um, because it is crucial. It's critical. Uh, Gibson didn't put serial numbers on everything that they made. Uh, that's a whole other topic. Yeah. Uh, but... The factory order numbers were essential to production. A factory order number is, is not a great mystery. It's, it's even something that's used today. And it's, it's really for the purposes of inventory control and production accounting. Those two things. That's what it's used for. It's inventory control and production accounting. Uh, at Gibson, we're, are, we're fortunate to have uh, had a, an eyewitness uh, to the use of the production numbers, uh, the, the factory order numbers, um, they originated just as a uh, sort of a. Jason, have you seen like a receipt book? Uh, you know, it has maybe four or five receipts on a page, sure, sure. and uh, usually has a piece of carbon paper or something yeah. in there, and and you know it's got a little little uh, pre-printed number in the upper right hand corner. Sure. Well, that, that's what the factory order numbers started out as. Somebody somebody went down to the local stationery store, and they bought uh, a pad of uh, receipts like that. And, uh, you know, it had this number in the upper right-hand corner. And about once a week, they had a production meeting. And at that production meeting, they would decide what they were going to build, you know, in the coming days. And there'd be some secretary sitting there. And... Uh, uh, you know, some guy hard or somebody would say, "Well, we need to build uh, some L5 guitars." You know, let's let's build 24 L5 guitars. So the secretary would take one of those receipts and, and write on there 25 uh, L5 guitars, uh, and 
the, the top copy was torn off, handed to the production manager, and the carbon copy went to the accounting department. Okay. That pre-printed number up there at the top uh, was the factory order number, and it was the number used out on the production floor every time they did something to that batch of guitars, all right, like this. Mm-hmm. The production manager takes that slip of paper down to the first floor to the white wood shop, and he says, okay, you know, here we go. Uh, the manager says we're going to build uh, two dozen L5s. All right, you, you go pull enough curly maple, you go pull enough spruce, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. You get everything we need. Okay, how much we got here? We've got uh, 20 board feet of this. We've got 50 board feet of that. I'm writing that down. Okay, we're charging that off to this number, and that information is going back upstairs to the accounting crew so that they know that in this batch of L5s, we've used up this much lumber, that's for inventory control, and at this cost, that's for the production accounting. You follow me? Mm-hmm. All right. Then after they saw up, you know, and they, they, they've made all the pieces, uh, they go from the white wood shop uh, upstairs to uh, assembly, where they get assembled together. Uh, and we're using, we're pulling tuners, we're pulling bridge pins, we're pulling uh, viscaloid for uh, pick guards. You know, each time a new part or raw material is pulled for this batch, it's charged back to that number upstairs in the county. So at the end of the production process, this batch of 24 L5 guitars, the production people, the accounting people, know exactly how much raw material and sub-assemblies and parts went into it, and they know how much it cost, and they knew how much needed to be reordered to restock. Okay? Now, as the as the instruments move along the production line, they each get stamped or well, there were some sometimes it was a red pencil, sometimes it was a lead pencil, sometimes it was an ink stamp. They each get that number put on there, uh, you know, so that they the people who are working know that this this bunch of guitars is this batch and that's the number that, that everything has to be charged back to. And if it's the first guitar in the rack, it's dash one. And if it's the second one it's dash hmm. two. The third one is dash three. Okay, and that was the same for everything that ran through the factory. If it was a ukulele, if it was a harp guitar, if it was an L5, if it was a master tone banjo, every piece of instrument that came out of that factory had a factory order number at some time or another. Uh, In some cases, those numbers don't appear on the instruments today. Uh, In some cases, they're just difficult to find. But every Gibson instrument produced before World War II had a factory order number that was assigned as part of that batch from the beginning of the production. So factory order numbers have to do with inventory control, production accounting, and they have to do from the beginning. They're part of the manufacturing process. Now, serial numbers. Let's talk about serial numbers for a second. Okay. Serial numbers were not assigned until just before the instrument shipped. Okay. Eyewitness testimony, Jason. Mm-hmm. Eyewitness testimony. Up on the third floor where they kept completed instruments, you know, you got these big rolling racks. Everybody's seen the pictures of the rolling racks. Mm-hmm. Right? And we get a we get an order come in from Grinnell Brothers or New York Band Instrument or Continental Music out there in San Francisco. Uh, you know, they want uh, 10 of these uh, L10 guitars. Okay, uh, you know, somebody go pull the L10s, bring them down here to final inspection. Right at final inspection, uh, the guitar was, of course, inspected for finished flaws and, and, you know, any kind of manufacturing defect. It was, uh, the serial number was given to it and applied inside the guitar at that time. Then it was strung up, and then it was cased, and then it was sent out the door. All right, so that means that maybe that L10 guitar had sat there 12 months, mm-hmm. you know, from the time it was produced, but it didn't get a serial number until 12 months later. That's why the factory order numbers and the serial numbers don't always agree with one another. And that's been a 
big, big problem for Gibson scholars because the guitar players had a little piece of it, the mandolin players had a little piece of it, and the banjo players all had a little piece of this, but nobody was talking to anybody else and sharing information. I'm the first person to talk to everybody, you know, and pull the guitar players' information in, and the mandolin players, and the banjo players, and then have access to the original records, things like the accounting records, and be able to see, oh, you know, this is the way that the factory order numbers worked. What these guys told me is obviously true, because I see it. I see, I, see the, I see the pattern of it. I see what they were doing. Uh, I just had, I'm the first person to have enough material all together in one place to make sense out of it. And it's a mess. <laughs> it's an ungodly mess, Jason. So, uh, because, and what would happen when one of those receipt books I'm talking about, when it, when it ran out, you know, they would just grab another receipt book. Well, they might not pay any attention to whether it was the next book uh, numerically, you know, they didn't care as long as they just had a, a unique number that they could assign those production values to. So, you know, one one week they're working on batch 1200, 1201, 1202, and the next week they're working on batch 346. So, you know, you can't, it's impossible to line up the numbers uh, in numeric value and say, you know, this was the batch in March and this was the batch in April and this was the batch in June and so on and so forth. It's just not possible to do that. So, I mean, all we can say is in 1935, they used these numbers, you know, between this value and this value. Were there, were there any got, black hole years where you just couldn't find any data or the ledgers were gone? Well, of course, the ledgers don't exist before 35. Uh -huh. Um but, again, you know, the Mandolin Archive, oh, my God, uh, you know, Dan Beanborn. I mean, yeah. he's just done Yeoman's work, uh, getting, uh, pulling these serial numbers and their associated factory order numbers together and posting it on the web. That's just a tremendous resource for somebody like me, for anybody, really. And banjo players like myself have been collecting factory order numbers for a year for years. So what I was able to do is I organized the data into big spreadsheets. I could see where the holes were, and by method of exclusion, I could say, okay, here's a batch of L double O's. Right, they don't fit over here, you know, because I got the ledgers over here, and I know that's not right. And they didn't make L double O's before like 1932. So, so okay, it doesn't go over there, so it must be 32, 33, or 34. Okay, well, I've already, I've already excluded 33 and 34 for this particular number, so it must be 32. See how that works? Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. And, and after, after years... It's like a giant Sudoku that, puzzle, or however they call it. <laughs> it and, that, and, that's, and, that's, and that's all I do every day when, in working with genealogy is put big puzzles back together sure. again. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I was able really, really for the first time, it was so funny, I, I went to um, one of the vintage guitar shows this past year down here at Kissimmee, uh, one of the groups that travels around the country was putting it on, and uh, I was talking to George Gibson, uh, a vintage dealer that I've known for years, and uh, I was talking about the book, and he says, my God, are you going to be able to tell us whether a guitar is a 32, a 33, or a 34. Yeah. And I said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to be able to do that. You know, we're, we're definitely going to be able to do that. So uh, I, was, I was able to make good on that, and it's all in the book. Which, uh, if you don't mind me asking, which group, the banjo players, the guitar players, or the mandolin players, have the biggest shock in for themselves in terms of what they thought? <laughs> was? <laughs> which group has the biggest shock? I mean, well, uh, if, if you read uh, Mandolin Cafe uh, today or yesterday, you know that uh, uh, they're already uh, a little uh, in a little bit of shock uh, over their F5 mandolin numbers. Um the banjo players kind of have a heads up on everybody because I've been posting some of this information on the banjo hangout now for a couple of years. Uh, and uh, so they've had a little time to get used to the fact that uh, Earl Scruggs' Granada Mastertone is not a 1934 instrument. It's a 
30 instrument. Wow, it's quite a uh, difference. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of a big difference. Uh, you know, they, but they'd have a little time to adjust the yeah. band of players. Um, so I would say, you know, the people that, that really I've not had a lot of uh, communication with would be the guitar players. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I, think, I think everybody's got some revelations coming out of this material. But uh, I think the guitar players probably most of all. Because, uh, you know, there's more up there. <laughs> yeah, there are. It's true. Were, were you able to shed any light on sort of those weird Gibson instruments that seem to combine kind of different eras and uh, look like they're just parts grabbed off a shelf? Or were those guitars and instruments just kind of parts grabbed off a shelf and thrown on something? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a couple things going on there, uh, Jason, that was pretty interesting. Um, I do have copies of the shipping ledgers. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I noticed early on in working with the shipping ledgers uh, was that uh, they would they would list an instrument in there, and then they would put exchange out beside it. You know, like uh, one F12 mandolin, serial number 98011, uh, exchange, New York band instruments. Hmm. And, uh, you know, okay, what, is, what, what the hell does exchange mean? What is that? You know, so... so you know, I'm, I'm 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 getting a list of questions together, and as I'm talking to the people that work there and, and other people, you know, they're like, "Oh, well, that was that was the dealer exchange program." I'm like, okay, well, what? What is that? Well, here was the deal: if you were a dealer and you purchased a harp guitar, okay, and that harp guitar sat there in inventory for five years, and the only thing it did was gather dust, you, as a Gibson dealer, could exchange that harp guitar for another instrument of same or greater value. You know, you might have to put some money with it, but but you could exchange it for another instrument. So there was a constant flow of these older instruments back to the factory to the point that one eyewitness, a man who worked there in 38, 1938, said that there were hundreds and hundreds of these mm, sort of antiquated models sitting around in those rolling racks everywhere in the factory. His exact words were, every place there was a little space, somebody had pushed one of these rolling racks (laughs) over there. You know, and and they might have two harp guitars and a style O guitar or a couple of uh, A junior mandolins or uh, you know maybe a maybe a really fancy Granada master tone that nobody had been ever ever been able to sell because it cost too much money you know it just all kinds of things and uh, this particular man that I was talking to his father also worked at the factory uh, and was the head of the repair department and he said that my he said my dad would if he needed a part he said an instrument would come in for repair, and my dad would need a part. He would go to these unsold instruments and, and, and steal parts off of them, you know, because some of them were obsolete parts that they couldn't get from Grover or Waverly or whoever anymore. So, so you get these antiquated instruments sitting around that had the tuners stolen off of them. Uh, you know, or the bridge pins were gone, or I mean, you just you can imagine what would happen over time as they needed these parts to repair instruments that had come in for customers. Well, then the next part of this story is they get an order for a harp guitar. Well, you know, I'm sorry. In 1939, they're not building <laughs> harp guitars anymore. You know, all those guys that built the harp guitars, they're all dead. You know, and they're or they're retired. They're gone. But, you know, here's a piece of one sitting here. If we could just get a set of tuners on it, you know, and you can see what they did. So you'd get a, a 1919 harp guitar with a set of Waverly Butterbean tuners on it. You know, something something really, really odd. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened. Because of this dealer exchange program, they had these antiquated instruments coming back into stock. And they had to hold them there at the factory as, you know, unsold, new, old stock. And they would, they would just steal parts from time to time to do repairs. And then if they got an, if they got an order to sell one of these things, they kind of pass it up the best way they could, you know, and, and out the door it went, uh, you know. So. <laughs> and, and that was all there was to it. It was very simple. 
yeah. So, so tell me more a bit more about this book. How how many pages? Uh, what's what's it what's it like? Two hundred ninety six pages. Okay, wow. Um, at the back, uh, there are four appendices, uh, and the last appendix is uh, eight color pages of uh, very rare Gibson material from the collection of Steve Huber. Uh, Bill, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Steve has one of the, Steve has one of the best collections of Gibson stuff anywhere, uh, and so lots of really cool photographs there at the back of stuff that even I had never seen. And I, you know, I've been messing with this my whole life. Uh, Steve was gracious enough to, to give us those to go in the book. Um, lists of the employees. There's a complete list of all the employees I could find before or two and what they did and when they worked there about 800 of those guys. Um, there's a revision on the serial numbers, uh, so we don't have to use George Gruen's serial number list anymore, thank mm -hmm. God. And uh, as I said, hundreds of pages of factory order number tables um, talk about the teacher agents in another chapter, some of the dealers in another chapter, kind of a little background of that. Um, in the employee chapter, uh, I selected a few of the employees to give little uh, uh, vignettes of their life. You know, what, what was it like mm -hmm. at Gibson? Because some of them worked there for their entire life until they literally dropped dead at the factory. And others had very brief careers but actually made big impact. Um, one of the guys that comes to mind is a man named Neil Keevitt. Uh Neil was a commercial artist. He was hired at in 1926, uh, and uh, the first job they gave him was designing uh, the um, decorations on the Florentine and Bella Voce banjos. Wow, the okay. The carvings on the back of the resonator, but the, the scenes on the fingerboard, you know, has a little scenes of Venice on the fingerboard. Uh, all that decoration was the, the design work of Neil Keevitt. And uh, after the after the instruments went into production, he hand painted the resonators and and so on and so forth. Well, uh, in I think it's 1929, uh, the factory let him go, you know, and and he went he moved to another part of the country. He worked as a commercial design artist for other companies, uh, and eventually died kind of a young man. I think he was 48, 49 years, and and he's completely forgotten. You know, he was only there for four years, but you know, the, the Bella Voce and the Florentine banjos are iconic pre-war instruments for sure. Gibson. You know, if you're if you're a tenor banjo player, you know, ooh, a Florentine. You know, they they all know what that is. Uh, you know, an all-American, a Bella Voce. They they all know what those are. And Neil Kivitt did all that design work, but nobody remembers him now. You know, he's gone. So, uh, and you know, little little things like that it was interesting to bring those forward. I was able to get a picture of him from his son, uh, who remembered, you know, yeah, Dad did this. Uh, you know, that, that, that was what my dad did. You know, he, he talked about that. Um, so you know, it was kind of fun to bring that forward to show the different experiences people had. Uh, you know, Lloyd Lohr, for one. Uh, Guy Ferris, Guy Hart. Um, uh, John Heiss. Uh, John Heiss uh, started as a kid there at the factory. Uh, he he worked there. Oh my God! He knew every job in the factory. Uh, and finally, in the fifties, he resigned from Gibson and went with uh, Bigsby. Uh, oh wow! Uh, God, I can't remember the other guy's name. That owned Bigsby, but um, you know, here was a guy who spent his entire career at Gibson uh, and knew every job from start to finish. Uh, so you know, a lot of I was able to bring a lot of contrast uh, and show you know what it was like to work six days a week at Gibson. Uh, they didn't have Saturdays off. They worked six days a week, but uh, they had they had two holidays, Thanksgiving and Christmas. Uh, there was a company picnic, Fourth of July, um, and that was it. You know, did uh, uh, did, did any it, employees actually play music? Yeah, a lot of them. A lot of them did, absolutely. And uh, it was so funny because one of the things I came to expect in talking to the children of these people was that they would tell me something like that you know that oh yeah you know dad and his brothers they all played music and, and uh, you know I really shouldn't be telling you this but you know 
once in a while, Dad would sneak some parts out of the factory. You know, <laughs> and he he built a few guitars on the side, you know, and 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 it was so funny because every single one of them would say the same things. You know, there must have been a tremendous amount of thievery <laughs> going on there at Parson Street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. I, and, you know, that continued on into the 50s and 60s. Yeah. Um, you know, there were there were a lot of uh, people that, that continued to work at Gibson that also had careers as musicians. Mm-hmm. Great. I, I'm fascinated to see this book. I can't wait to see it. Um, thank you so much for talking to us. Absolutely, man. I love your magazine. Uh, you know, I, I buy it whenever I can off the newsstand and you do a great job, great uh, great photos, uh, always interesting articles. Thank uh, you. Uh, very, so, very interested in your magazine. So once again, uh, the the name of the book is Span's Guide to Gibson, 1902 to 1941, and it's uh, currently on uh, Elderly's website and Amazon and uh, wherever good guitar geek books are sold, I suppose. That's right. Uh, Barnes & Noble, Borders, all those places. Um, it's a Hal Leonard book, so it will be widely available. Any any music store uh, usually can order from Hal Leonard. Great. Uh, so it won't, won't be difficult to find. All right. Thank you so much, Joe. You too, Jason. I appreciate okay. it. Okay, bye-bye.